if you're listening to The Andrew Lawton Show on 980 CFPL. The Iraqi military, as I've talked about on the show, has said that it is, as a country, completely liberated from ISIS. The Iraqi government, the prime minister, has said something very similar. This is a tremendously positive outcome. Now, of course, it doesn't eliminate the threat that ISIS poses ideologically and and even domestically in those regions as well. But it's a step in the right direction. That being said, it has, as a force, left a great many victims in Iraq that are still there, victims of a declared and expressed genocide on the part of radicals. Now, the U.S., as Mike Pence has promised, is changing up the rules to help Christian and other minority victims of what's been going on in Iraq here. And and one of the people who's been a a consistent force in standing up for people that have faced such persecution around the world, and a man who has been just so consistent on this and and so devoted on this file, is Reverend Majed El Shafi, who's the founder and president of One Free World International. And he's been on the show before, but I wanted to bring him back on here. Uh, Reverend, good to talk to you. Thanks very much for joining me today. Pleasure having um, you with me on the phone. Thank you. Let's talk first off about what we actually see in Iraq here, because a lot of people are are no doubt familiar with ISIS and its legacy, but I don't think a lot of people understand the demographics of who it is that has been targeted by by this and and in collateral damage in some cases as well. Well, definitely what we saw in, in Iraq and in Syria as well is not less than a genocide. Uh, uh, targeted of religious minorities, killing them, sex slavery, gang rapes. Uh, we saw this in the last three, four years, and sadly the world did so little too late, and now uh, the the UN, considering what's happening to the Yazidis and Christians, as a genocide. Now, the announcements that took place uh, from the vice president, why is the breakthrough? Why it's the news? Because for the first time, basically, the American government coming and saying UN is not effective. And we have to pass the UN. We have to support local NGOs. We have to go on the ground to ensure that this aid is going to the vulnerable minorities, to ensure that this aid is not going to corrupt the government and going to the people that they actually need it. So when, that's why it's a breakthrough. When Canada yeah. resettled uh, thousands of refugees from Syria, when other countries have resettled refugees, a lot of that has gone through the UN's refugee resettlement program. So why is it the UN, you're saying, is ineffective on this file when they've been the force that's been streamlining refugees around the world? And I'm, I'm not trying to put the UN down, but quietly and honestly, I'm a man that been, I've been on the ground many, many times and for the last three, four years on the ground where I get local people on the ground coming and telling me UN is standing for United Nothing. Now, I'm not saying that the UN is doing everything wrong, but I'm also saying that UN is not doing everything right. When you go to the refugee camps in Iraq, you found that the, the vulnerable minorities being pushed out of the refugee camps uh, in the UN. We see that there is a corruption. We see that the UN dealing with the Iraqi government or the Kurdish government, where most of our aid that's sent from Canada or America or Europe or Australia are not going to the people that they need it. They go to corrupt the government that maybe high, some of the high officials will take them in their pocket or use them in the black market where they are making an extra dollar. So the truth and the reality, the lack of accountability with the UN the fear that some of the locals that work with the UN is corrupted or discriminating against minorities is exists. And the fact that we are remaining silent about it is not bringing any solution, especially for the little guy or the vulnerable minority facing persecution. We hear from a lot of Muslim activists in North America that Muslims are the ones that are most impacted negatively by ISIS. And I was wondering if you could speak to why it matters to break down into different groups, whether it's Yazidis or or Christians or Muslims who are are victims of ISIS. Do you find that there is a shortfall in that some agencies are only helping certain groups and not just anyone who's impacted? Absolutely, and that's uh, that's where the UN went short. So right now we're talking about the vulnerable minorities. Let's just talk about what's the meaning of vulnerable minorities. Vulnerable minorities is a minority that doesn't have militias 
to protect them, doesn't use weapon to protect them, and they get burned from both sides, the Sunnis and the Shias. Now, this minorities can be from the Christian community to the Yazidi community, to the Baha'is, to the Sabians and Mandians, uh, to the homosexual community, all of these communities that does not have militias to protect them, they are facing persecution from both sides, from the Shias militias, from the Sunni militias, and quite honestly, if you have a militia to protect you, then survive in your own. But with these minorities that nobody cares about them, they are getting killed and massacred and gang raped and sick slaved every single day while we're watching and the UN is not doing enough. So what will this policy shift in the U.S. accomplish practically? What is it actually doing here? Well, it's actually what's doing here is bringing accountability and making the U.S. stream directly to the local NGOs and local organizations, faith, some of them faith-based, which is the U.N. try to ignore. Why are you trying to ignore a faith-based organization? There is nothing wrong with this organization being Christian or a Muslim or a Jewish or a Hindu or Sikh. What's wrong with that? There is nothing wrong with faith-based organizations. So basically what, what it's doing is getting the funds and the aid streamed directly to this organization to make sure that it's going directly to this uh, local communities, whatever the local community is facing persecution, with proper accountability in an order to ensure that the little guy is receiving funds without the big government being corrupt and taking this aid in their pocket. Are these local groups in Iraq reliable, or is there a risk that they've been infiltrated by some of the groups that uh, we're concerned about with the UN? Of course, there is always a risk. There is no organization on the ground that will ever will be 100% perfect. But definitely, they've been on the ground for many years. They've been in contact with these communities for many years, and they've been bringing a lot of good results, sometimes even better than the UN, quite honestly, without even the funds from outside world. It was a private charities, private funds from a good people around the world that helping them, and they've been doing good results on the ground. So maybe now with the government, American government behind them, maybe we will be able to see even better and better results. And the American government connected to continue the supporting them with the results, which is very important. How has Canada approached this issue? We've not really done anything without the UN's direct involvement in this area, have we? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Canada and the Liberal government being dealing that the UN is the one and the only, the Alpha and Omega. Uh, with my own respect, they are not. And with my own respect, we found that the UN failed in many areas, not in total, but in many areas, especially when it comes to distributing the aid to the vulnerable minorities. I think Canada has to be balanced between dealing with the UN. I'm not saying don't deal with the UN. I'm, see, I'm saying find a balance dealing with the UN and the local NGOs and put proper accountability through our Canadian embassy on the ground or Amer or Canadian consulate in an order to ensure the proper aid reaching the people that they needed. And what I find really interesting here is that the U.S. Ha has pinpointed specific towns and communities, not just ethnic and religious communities, but specific geographic communities, which means this is a very well thought out idea. I mean, they're going in this with very pure intentions, and it sounds like they've done a lot of the research. Absolutely. They have their intelligence on the ground. They have the resources, the research, the open doors. Listen, for the last I can't remember, three, four months, we've been trying to meet with uh, our immigration minister to tell him about what's the situation on the ground, to explain to him. And the guy doesn't even have a half an hour to meet with us. He's very this is busy. Canada's immigration minister, Hassan? Yes, absolutely, yes. When you don't meet with the people on the ground, you don't have a full information. When you don't meet with locals, when you don't meet with people that they are in touch I'm, I'm offering the immigration minister to sit down with the Yazidi victims that we rescued them, that they are here in Canada. Sit down, listen to them, see what they are saying. From their conversation, from a proper research, you will get the proper information that you will know how to target your aid after that. How have you managed to get so connected with these groups in Iraq? Uh, our team's been there for years and years. We cared. 
We have we connected with the locals. We have partners on the ground that would give us intelligent information, will tell us where, where is the need. Uh, our organization sent before medical aid. Uh, we went there before and we rescued many of the Yazidi girls. We are proud of our accomplishment there, and we will not stop. We will continue. If the Canadian government with us or not, we don't care. But I wanted you to answer that question because you've expressed the years that you've invested in this. You didn't just read an article and say the government should do this. You've been putting in the legwork. You've been on the ground here, and you can't even get half an hour with our minister. Absolutely. And, and even when the citizenship committee uh, been, was attacked from a liberal, uh, liberals in peace, the truth and the reality, this is not about liberal. This is not about conservative. This is not about the NDBs. That's not about the Greens. This is about one fact. This is not about left or right. This is about one simple fact. The Yazidi community, the Christian community, the minorities uh, is facing persecution, is facing genocide, and we have to do something. We have to move forward with the help of the UN and the help of the local NGOs in an order to ensure that the corruption does not get our aid, my aid, my tax money, your tax money, that basically ensure that this money reaching the people that they are helping to rescue them and to save their lives. Joining me on the line, Reverend Majed El Shafi, founder and president of One Free World International. Reverend, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on today, and God bless you, sir. God bless you, too. Thank you. All right. All the best to you, sir. Just a horrific scene that you see and have seen historically over the last several years out of Iraq. And now they've been liberated from ISIS. But the whole point is there are still a great many consequences and repercussions and people that are still victims that are waiting for help. So I hope any government could step up for all, regardless and irrespective of religion. When we come back in a couple of moments, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on 980 CFPL.